daughter uh, in my family to go to college. Um, <laughs> this past December, I graduated a semester early from the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. <laughs> um, and this summer, I will be crossing the stage um, to get my diploma. Um, I have two younger sisters who are following my path, not in the same way, but in their own special ways. And I've been able to encourage them to pursue their dreams and careers. The push that I, have, that I gave them paid off, and now they will be going to, off to college in full rights, and I'm very, very proud of them. Yeah. <laughs> and today, I have the honor to introduce a true breaker of barriers, Vice President Kamala Harris. <laughs> Vice President Harris is a trailblazer who has been a historic first throughout her career. The first black woman in district attorney in California, the first black woman to be a California attorney general, the first senator of South Asian descent, and now the first woman the first black American and the first Asian American to serve as vice president. She opens, she opens the door for us. She empowers us to step into the room and be ourselves, to use our voice and make decisions. And this is exactly what we'll do this November. So please give me Give, please join me and give me the Minnesota woman for Biden welcome to the first, but certainly not the least, Vice President Kamala Harris. Yeah. Janet, I want to thank you for that introduction and the inspiration she and I were talking backstage. I mean, I just, I, I love our young leaders. I love, and our youngish leaders, and uh, you know, all of us. Um, but we, she and I were talking. I mean, there's so much about what we are all fighting for that is truly about her and about all of our young leaders who are here. And we are in this together. It is multi-generational. It is multi-everything. And we are a community of people who understand that nobody should be made to fight alone. So it is good to be back in Minnesota. I want to thank Governor Tim Waltz and the mayor who are here. And Madam Speaker, all of the leaders who are here. And thank you for welcoming me back to St. Paul. I want to thank everyone, um, including, of course, the Majority Leader Murphy, who I believe is also here, um, for your leadership. So the victories that you all have won, and in particular at the State House, have once again demonstrated to our nation just how much progress a democratic trifecta can make. I was talking with your leaders backstage, and I said the beauty of this is not only the success that you all have achieved and what has come out of it, in terms of how you've organized and activated, but the beauty of it is also for people who can't imagine what a democratic trifecta can do, we can point to you so those who may have never seen what it could look like can now see how we can empower the people, all people, by doing this good work. We are also joined today by Representative Betty McCullum. She, there she is. She honored me with traveling with me on Air Force Two from Washington, D.C. here today, and I want to thank you. And Representative Elon Omar, who is here, with her beautiful daughter, who is vice president at her school. <laughs> and the two Congress members are, without any question, extraordinary fighters in Washington, D.C. for the people of this state. Senator Klobuchar, let's give a shout out to her. I 
I talked to her on the way here. She wanted to be here, but she's in Washington, D.C., fighting the good fight. Um, and I did serve with her in the United States Senate for a few years, and I have to tell you, she really is a fighter, and she loves the state and the people of the state. So let us, uh, and also on the subject of Senator Klobuchar, let's make sure we send her back to D.C. We need her there, and she's been a wonderful friend and advisor to the President and me. All right, so my mother had many sayings. And she would often say to me, Kamala, you may be the first to do many things, but make sure you are not the last. So I look at the young leaders here today, and I know I will not be the last. And that makes me so joyful. As Vice President, I will tell you also, I have traveled now to at least 20 countries in every hemisphere of our world. And I do believe, and I think many here know, that a measure of the strength of a democracy is based on the status and standing of the women in that country. You can measure the strength of a democracy by evaluating and assessing the strength and the standing of the women. And with the support of the leaders here, President Joe Biden and I then, have been intentional about what we do to lift up the status of the women of our nation. And so let's start with the fact that, I think we all know, when you lift up the economic status of women, the economic status of women, families benefit, communities benefit, and all of society benefits. So today we are together with you building a future where every woman has the economic power to support her family and pursue her dreams. Take on, for example, the issue of student loan debt. <laughs> Women carry nearly two-thirds of all student loan debt. Two-thirds. So we have canceled nearly $138 billion in student loan debt for almost 4 million Americans and counting. On average, more than $30,000 per person. And for public servants, for example, our teachers. Can we give a shout out to our teachers? And I know the governor and congresswoman were former teachers, and I don't think anyone ever stops being a teacher, by the way. Um, and so for public servants like our teachers, and more than 70% of whom are women, the average loan forgiveness is over $60,000. Thank you. You know, my first grade teacher attended my law school graduation. Oh. I love our teachers. I love our teachers. Um, to lift up the economic status of women, we have invested in women entrepreneurs and small business owners across our nation. Millions of women who want to start or grow business but do not have the funds to do so. So I've been working on this since I was in the Senate. But to invest now, as an administration, the President and I, billions of dollars to expand access to capital for women small business owners. To lift up the status of women, President Biden and I have lowered health care costs, in particular the cost of insulin for our seniors. A fifth, one-fifth of women over the age of 65 have diabetes. And too many have had to make the choice between filling their prescription or filling their refrigerator. Knowing also that seniors who are women are 80% more likely to live in poverty. Think about that. And we can think of the myriad of reasons why. So President and I have capped the cost of insulin for our seniors at $35 a month. And we capped the entire annual cost of prescription medication to $2,000 a year. And when we win re-election, we're going to cap the cost of prescription medication for everyone. <laughs> On another subject, Minnesota, can we agree that in the 21st century, it should not be the case that in the United States of America, women die at a higher rate in connection with childbirth than women in any other wealthy nation in the world. 
It's a shame. And it is a crisis, the crisis of maternal mortality. And of the many factors that contribute to this crisis, one of the most significant is that millions of women in America, in particular low-income women, do not have access to adequate postpartum care. In fact, when we took office, I took a look at it, and the majority, the vast majority of American women on Medicaid were entitled to only two months of coverage for postpartum care. When we took office, only three states in our nation offered 12 months of postpartum care. So many of you know me, so you will not be surprised. I said, all right, I'm going to issue a challenge to every state in our nation. Extend Medicaid postpartum coverage from a measly two months to 12 months. And I am proud to report so far, a total of 45 states have now answered the challenge. So all of this, and I could go on and on, but all of this is to say that over the past three years, we have made incredible progress. And we are clear-eyed, even as we fight to lift up the women and all the people of our nation. There are those who are intent on dragging us backward, intent, a full-on agenda that's about taking us back and attacking, full-on attacking hard-fought, hard-won freedoms. The freedom to vote, the freedom to be safe from the horror of gun violence, the freedom to be who you are and love who you love openly and with pride, and the freedom of a woman to make decisions about her own body and not having her government tell her what to do. So as everyone here knows, almost two years ago, the highest court in our land, the court of Thurgood and RBG, took a constitutional right that had been recognized from the people of America from the women of America. And since then, in states across our nation, extremists have proposed and passed laws to criminalize health care providers and punish women. Laws that threaten doctors and nurses with prison time, even for life, go to Texas, you'll see that. Simply for doing what? Providing health care. I was at a clinic today with the congresswoman and governor I mean, let's be clear, and, and the, the reporter said, well, you're, you've made history, I guess, again, because, you know, I did. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> and they said, you're the first president or vice president to ever uh, visit a, a health care clinic, an abortion clinic. Why are you here? And I said, because you've got to understand, when these laws, when, when the court took this right away, they created a health care crisis in America. So what has happened in so many of these states is these clinics have shut down. And so then I said to the press, and I said, get ready for the words I'm about to use. <laughs> Uterus, <laughs> fibroids, <laughs> pap smears, yes. breast cancer exams. Yes. That's part of what these clinics provide. Necessary, vital health care in addition to abortion care. And across the country, thankfully not here because of the strength of all of you, but across the country, they've passed laws making no exception even for rape or incest. You know, many of you know that my background as I started my career as a prosecutor, you may not know why. One of the reasons is that when I was in high school, I learned that my best friend was being molested by her stepfather. And I said to her, then, you've got to come and stay with us. I called my mother. My mother said, of course she does. And she came to stay with us. So I decided very early in my life that I wanted to do the work that was about protecting women and children from abuse and violence. The idea that they are proposing and passing laws that make no exception even for rape or incest. So they're saying to a survivor of a crime of violence to their body, a violation to their body, that they have no right to make a decision about what happens to their body next? That's immoral. 
immoral. And on the subject overall, I think we all agree, let us all agree, one does not have to abandon their faith or deeply held beliefs to agree the government should not be telling her what to do with her body. We trust women. We trust women to know what is in their best interest. And today, in some states, we just saw extremists are even attacking the freedom to use IVF treatment. And understand it can happen anywhere. That's an example of it happening. I talked about this when the Dobbs decision was leaked. Let's see where this could end up. So think about it. Women and couples being denied the ability to fulfill their dream of having a child. And consider the irony. So on the one hand, they're saying, you don't have the freedom to end an unwanted pregnancy. And on the other hand, you don't have the freedom to start a family. Consider the irony. And by the way, while these extremists say they are motivated by the well-being of women and children, they are silent on the crisis of maternal mortality. The top 10 states with the highest rates of maternal mortality all have abortion bans. The hypocrisy abounds. And as we know, there is nothing hypothetical about anything we've just discussed. The crisis is real. Since Roe was overturned, I have met women who have had miscarriages in toilets. I met a woman who went to the emergency room to receive care and was turned away repeatedly because the doctors were afraid that they could go to jail for giving her care, and it wasn't until she developed sepsis. And in this health care crisis, let us all recognize who is to blame. The former President Donald Trump handpicked three members of the United States Supreme Court with the intention that they would overturn Roe. He intended for them to take your freedoms, and he brags about it. He said that for years, and then I'm going to quote, they were trying to get rid of Roe v. Wade. They're trying to have Roe v. Wade terminated, he said. And then he said, quote, I did it, and I'm proud to have done it. Proud. Proud that women across our nation are suffering. Proud that doctors and nurses could be thrown in prison for administering care. Proud that young people today have fewer rights than their mothers and grandmothers? How dare he? The former president is the architect of a health care crisis. And the extremists, well, they're not done. In the United States Congress, extremists tried to pass a national abortion ban to outlaw abortion in every single state. But they need to know is that if Congress passes a national abortion ban, President Joe Biden will veto it. He will veto it. And when we together win majorities in the United States Congress, and Congress passes a bill that reinstates the protections of Roe v. Wade, Joe Biden will sign it into law. So ultimately, here's the deal as I see it. In this election, we each face a fundamental question. And that question is, what kind of country do we want to live in? Do we want to live in a country of liberty, freedom, and rule of law, or a country of disorder, fear, and hate? And each of us has the power to answer these questions in so many ways, including, of course, at the ballot box. So Minnesota, in this election, together, let us fight for our freedoms. Let us understand. Let us fight for individuality, for self-determination, for the dignity of all people. Let us fight 
for our democracy and born out of our love of country, let us fight for the promise of America. And when we fight, well, we win. God bless you. And God bless you.